Uh, this year we had something kind of catastrophic. That's too big a word, but hugely disappointing happen. Uh, we lost an entire beef to some beginner mistakes. And honestly, I've been sitting on this video for a long time waiting to do it because it just makes me so depressed to talk about. But ultimately, we run this channel because we want to help others who want to homestead and do things like what we're doing avoid making the mistakes that we've made. So in this video, we're gonna share with you 10, uh, maybe a couple bonus, things that we learned butchering our very first beef here on the homestead. We're gonna share the mistake that led to losing an entire beef, which is just, even as I say, it just makes me feel sad, uh, with the idea that maybe you in the future might do this and you can avoid these mistakes and things will go better on your homestead. That's why we share this. So let's dive into my list, the 10 things I learned butchering my first beef. Let's start with number one. Hi everybody, welcome to Homesteady. In today's episode, we're gonna share with you uh, some really good lessons if you're looking to butcher a cow, your own cow in the future. Just a brief note, for those of you who have been following us for a long time, you know the cow that we butchered, Ladybug. She was a very beloved cow. Uh, she wound up getting a disease that was going to kill her a slow, painful death. And so we decided that the kind thing to do would be to end her, her suffering before it even started. And we were assured by many professionals, veterinarians, uh, people in the meat industry who work in the beef industry that her, her meat was still entirely safe for our family to consume. So in today's video, you are going to see some footage from this process in the interest of education, sharing knowledge that can one day maybe help another homestead family. We're gonna share some of that video. Uh, you're not gonna see actual moment of death, uh, but you will see some of the process. So let's dive into the things that I learned uh, my very first time butchering a beef. Let's go to the first one. When you're going to process an animal, and I'm talking from fish to cow, ideally you have some time in between the actual kill and then the processing. From 12 hours to actually a couple days, and depending on the animal, like a cow, really does well with weeks. There's the kill day, and then there's later on the butchering day. And what we're gonna get into, we're gonna talk first about the kill day and some things I learned on the kill day, and then some things I learned on the actual butchering day. Obviously, kill day starts with the kill of the animal itself. And one of the questions that I had leading up to this was what is the right tool? I have been a hunter for a long time. I've used guns for many different things, uh, but a cow is different than a deer. It's different than a sheep. It's different than you know a lot of the things I've processed in the past. And so I did not personally feel very confident in just using like a 22 bullet 22 rifle. Now I know some people out there might argue with that. My concern with the 22 bullet is that it's small. If I were to be off a little bit, there could be problems. I wanted something that had a, uh, a little bit more room for error and would still deliver a good clean kill. I talked to two different veterinarians about this. Uh, if you're a large animal vet, you find a sick cow out in the field and you need to put it out of its misery, uh, you don't have a chute to put the animal in, something to keep it steady. What's the right tool for that? And Cody Creelman, who you've seen on the channel a lot, he was a beef specialist veterinarian. He suggested, and this is what we wound up using, using a shotgun. Uh, that might sound crazy. You might think to yourself, oh man, a shotgun, that's gonna cause like something extremely graphic, maybe just blow into pieces. Not at all. Uh, with the right size shot, and I'll put below the information about the exact shot that we used. But I can even link to the article that Cody shared with me. Uh, this was a veterinary uh, journal that wrote about what the right tool for putting a cow, killing a cow is. Absolutely, without a doubt, clean. It caused a hole about this large in the skull, but the skull's still intact. Nothing uh, graphic, no, no explosion of blood or guts, just a, a normal bullet hole. 
And the nice thing with the shotgun shot is that because there's so many small BBs coming at once, it collapses the bone into the brain and then just totally destroys the brain. So the animal is just lights out instantly. With a 22, if you were to be off a little bit and the animal had a thicker skull, some cows, uh, cows have a ridge down the middle of their skull that you have to be to one side or the other of, you could shoot that cow and actually get it wrong and the cow would be in horrible pain but it would not be brain dead. So I really suggest, first thing I learned, and this was from the mouth of two different vets, maybe others of you are thinking, oh, you know what, give it a shot, it's more peaceful. We've had veterinarians, we asked, they were here, we said to them, hey, what would you do? And they said, no, a, a bullet put some lights out. They're just sitting there happily eating out of a bucket and then they are asleep. If you go to put a needle into a cow, if you've ever tried to give your cow shots, you know. Cows hate being handled by strangers. They hate having strangers touch them and poke them and prod them with needles. Uh, so that would have been a very uneasy, scary experience for Ladybug. Instead, I had a bucket of feed. She was in her paddock. Everything was normal. It was peaceful. She was eating out of her bucket. I pulled the trigger. She dropped instantly. She was brain dead. And from that point forward, we were able to take care of the whole uh, gutting and skinning, uh, no unnecessary pain to her. She was instantly brain dead. And I would really suggest if you're going to be killing a cow, shotgun, 12 gauge shotgun. And like I said, I'll put below the exact shot that we use because there's a lot of different kinds of shotgun shots. So you don't want to use like, uh, you wouldn't want to use BBs that are too small. You want to have something that uh, has packs more of a punch. So I'll put that info and I'll have a link to that article below. First thing I learned, use a shotgun. Before we did the processing, I talked to a couple different butchers because I had a lot of questions. And one of the butchers I talked to, he had done cows for years. He said, uh, he used to have guys who would talk to him and say, oh, you know, ask questions about butchering a cow. And they'd say, well, I've butchered deer before, so I should be able to handle a cow. And he'd say, yeah, well, you know, you go to the grocery store and uh, buy groceries, but that doesn't mean you know how to stock the shelves. And his point was, Butchering a deer or butchering a pig or a sheep, it's a very different thing than butchering a cow. And that was the second thing I learned, and this is kind of like, duh, <laughs> but it's worth noting. Cows are huge. If you've butchered deer in the past, you've butchered pigs, you've butchered sheep, it, you might think, well, you know what? I've butchered a whole lot of animals. The cow's gonna be just the same process. And it's true, the way you cut the animal and skin it and all that, it's very, very similar. But a cow is a whole nother animal. It's large, it's heavy. You need to, you can throw a whole sheep or deer over your shoulder. That's not the case with a cow. And the weight that you're working with is actually dangerous, where if you have a cow hanging there and you're cutting and something breaks free and swings and whacks you and then you can wind up stabbing yourself with the knife. I mean, things can go wrong because it's such a big animal and you're dealing with so much weight. So the second point is really don't underestimate how much bigger and heavier a cow is. We had a tractor to lift the cow up with after the kill shot. We put the, the hooks into her legs and started lifting her up and the tractor, we have a John Deere tractor, it wasn't tall enough to get her completely off the ground. Uh, so maybe you have a tractor and think, oh, we'll just lift the cow up. Our cow was small. You might find your tractor's not tall enough to lift the cow up off the ground. Maybe you need a different system to raise it up. Just be prepared for a lot more size, a lot more weight, and make sure you have the right PPE. One of the things I added to my uh, equipment when we were butchering a cow was a chainmail apron. I'll have a link below uh, for the one I got. Uh, again, because you're dealing with something that's so much bigger and heavier and there's fatigue involved, you could slip with your knife and wind up hurting yourself. So while I've butchered animals before and I never used a chainmail apron, when it was time to do a cow, I upgraded. So don't underestimate the cow size. It's not like butchering a deer. It's not like butchering a sheep. It's a whole nother animal. Make sure you're ready for that size and that weight. One of the early steps to processing a large mammal is splitting the carcass in half. And you do this really so that it's easier to cut steaks, uh, especially if you're cutting on the bone steaks, you can take that half carcass and you can quarter it and you can work with it and things are just easier to do. 
after you've split the animal. So if you've ever, again, split a deer, split a sheep, it's a lot easier. You can take a hand saw, you can take a sawzall with a meat blade on it. Uh, all these are good solutions for splitting. Splitting a cow was very, very difficult, especially because we didn't have the proper gambrel set up. So I would suggest when you're going to process your first cow, make sure you buy a gambrel that's adjustable. A gambrel is something you can hook the legs to and then hook to something. We had the cow chained. And the problem with chains is it was hard to adjust where the tension was. And so for a lot of the process, the tension was pulling inward, kind of compressing the meat and the spine and everything was binding up really hard. Have a gambrel that you can easily adjust. Make sure it's pulling the carcass apart as you're cutting. Hand saws, not all hand saws are alike. I bought one from Weston, it was garbage. I'll put below which model it was so you don't buy it. It was trash. I wanted to hang the cow in halves. Split the cow and then hang it up. But because you have to take it down a flight of stairs, it was too heavy for me and a buddy to throw on our shoulders and walk down a staircase. The entrance of our butcher house, you gotta like duck to get through where the air conditioner unit is. It's kind of tricky. So we had to get her in in quarters, which is okay, you can hang a cow in quarters. The problem was I didn't hang it correctly. Learn, and this is where you know a good book can help, and I'm gonna talk about that next, but uh, get yourself a good book. Know the right way to hang the carcass, because especially if you're gonna age it, which a beef, again, you should at least age it a couple days to let the rigor mortis come and go. Uh, once you hang it, it will take a shape and it will hold that shape, and what I did is I hung it sloppily, and the front quarter was like, had a curve to it. And the day we went to cut the animal, we had to like bend it and like force it to get back to normal. And it just made everything more difficult. So make sure you hang a carcass. The best thing to do is hang it whole. Uh, if it's a beef and you wanna split it, split it. Um, and hang it in two halves and nice vertical halves, nice and straight, that'll keep everything good. If you gotta quarter it, learn the right way to, to hang quarters and make sure you don't do what I did, which is just get it up on a meat hook and walk away and a month later figure out you did it wrong. Which brings me to the next tip, which I already kind of leaked. Make sure to get a book. Do not count on the internet. Don't count on a video. Watch a bunch of internet videos. You know, go to vlogs and blogs for sure. But the day of, your fingers are gonna be covered in blood and meat and stuff. You don't wanna to have to pull your phone out and hit pause on a video every five minutes and then hit play and then pause again. Get your phone all gross and then it stops working. Buy a book. I have a link below to an awesome book, Kay Got Me, Butchering Beef. Fantastic book, link below. Uh, that way you can flip the pages at your own pace as you need to. And the nice thing about, you'll have the picture Whereas in a video, you know guys are working and they're sawing, they're cutting, and then they move to the next piece. You'll have a picture right there, boom, this is what it should look like when you're done, and that's very helpful. So buy a book, I got a link below to a great one. Let's go to the next point. This next tip for you applies to kill day and to butcher day, and that is get helpers. Ideally, like me, I was very, very fortunate a family friend had butchered animals for years, he was a butcher, was willing to come and help and show me and my brother-in-law how to cut the beef just right. And that was so awesome, so awesome. So uh, we were very fortunate to have a good teacher. But if you didn't have that, you can cut without someone there to teach you, especially if you watch some videos, get a book, you can do it but you definitely are gonna want helpers. A beef is so big, we go back to this point, there's so much just heavy lifting. Even if you have friends who don't know anything about butchering, who can just help move the meat. Imagine you're gonna be moving hundreds, if not a thousand pounds of meat that day. If, if you have to cut every single piece, move every single piece, wrap every single piece, you're gonna be so exhausted, especially if you don't do it all the time. So if you're new to this, like I was, uh, have a helper. I had two helpers on kill day. One of them was a hunter who had, 
you know, hunted elk before. So a shout out to Mike. Thanks for your help there, Mike. Uh, he knows how to skin a large animal, gut a large animal. So he was a huge help in the technical world. I also had a buddy who didn't really do much hunting, but was just there to be some help with heavy lifting. He uh, helped us with the cutting and stuff, and he was a huge help too. Even though he wasn't like used to butchering big animals, still just nice to have another set of hands there. So one or two helpers with skill, with some background, but even if not, at least someone there to help move things. Uh, totally great, great way to do it. So I had my helpers, Mike and Andy. Thanks guys for helping me out. Couldn't have done it without you guys. Uh, and then on butcher day, I had my brother-in-law and of course our good family friend, Bob, who uh, came and showed us exactly how to do it. And that was so, so great. So have helpers. The next tip I have for you, uh, something I learned doing my first cow, I've butchered lots of deer, lots of pigs. I never had a meat saw, like a professional meat saw. We were very fortunate. My father-in-law had a meat saw that he picked up at an old auction. My father-in-law, he's real good with uh, machines and things, so they shined it up, got it working again, and we were able to run a meat saw. A meat saw will make butchering a whole cow so much quicker, so much easier. It was awesome. Even an older one like the one we had uh, worked fantastic. But here's my tip. You don't actually need a meat saw. So if you're planning on butchering your first beef and you're like, ah, we can't afford a meat saw, you can do it with a handsaw. The butcher who came, Bob, to help us out that day, uh, he came with his big professional handsaw, really good handsaw, not like the one I had bought. Nice handsaw cut it up, uh, he was expecting to just do all hand sawing. So when he saw we had a meat saw, he was thrilled and we used the meat saw, but you don't need one. So nice to have, but without one, you still can get the whole beef done. So don't be scared either way. Now, when I butchered up this cow, uh, we at the time used butcher paper. And the reason for that was because I had seen in the book that I was reading about butchering to use paper. The butcher who was coming to teach us was used to using butcher paper. So we got some butcher paper, I got a big dispenser. It, it worked fine. But here's the, the lesson learned there. I would really suggest getting a vacuum sealer and vacuum seal bags. For one, the finished product is see-through. So when you're digging through your freezer, you can actually see the product. And if you don't do a good job at labeling, which would be a bonus tip, do a good job at labeling. But if you don't, you can look and see, oh look, that's a T-bone, obviously. So also, it does a better job at sealing, getting airtight, so your product won't get freezer burnt. I think if you're not skilled at wrapping, wrapping and taping and labeling, I think it's quicker to use a vacuum sealer. A good butcher who does it all the time probably could do it better with paper. I don't know, vacuum sealing is so quick. And we use a food saver model. I'll have a link below to the model we use. Food saver with the custom bags. The nice thing about that, and here's why it's such a good tip for if you have a homestead. Uh, if you're just doing this with like friends and family, uh, my daughter is able to run the vacuum sealer. So she can professionally zoop, boop, boop, run a vacuum sealer all day. She's nine years old, does a great job with it. Uh, harder for a nine-year-old or you know one of your kids helping out to do the paper properly. So it's one of those things that works better, it gets a better product, and more people can do it. So if you can splurge a couple hundred bucks or maybe a hundred bucks, they're not that expensive for a vacuum sealer, be worth your while. Now the next thing I want to show you is actually in our meat locker. We're going to head into there and I'm going to show you the next thing I learned. You can see the meat locker, it's uh, kind of built into the hillside. It used to be a root cellar for apple storage because there was an apple orchard here. We converted this into a meat locker and see the air conditioner unit? Let me show you how this works, come on in. All right, this is the meat locker and uh, We'll just be in here briefly. It's very echoey and loud with everything running. As you can see, I'm aging right now. I got some wild game, a pheasant. I got a deer hanging over here. Uh, this place has been awesome, this meat locker. Uh, huge project. You can watch that video there. It talks about the project a little bit. We converted this. This was a root cellar, which if you know anything about root cellars, it's going to be about 55 degrees, the temperature of the ground. 
we used this little guy here. It's called a cool bot. And what it is, is it's a little robot microcomputer thing. You hang it next to an air conditioner unit. You run a couple wires to the air conditioner unit. And what it does is it trips your air conditioner into the, thinking the room is still hot. So the air conditioner keeps running when normally it would shut off. And a regular window unit air conditioner, um, regular off the shelf unit, it trips it, fakes it out, and as you can see, the room is 36 degrees right now. The cool bot is keeping this room perfect temperature for aging. So if you're gonna do your own cow at home, you can actually build a room with sips or uh, just frame out a little box inside a garage and then super insulate it with just you know some insulation bats. Uh, whatever you do, you can insulate it like we did with spray foam, but that's my next tip and we're gonna talk about that. Uh, just make sure you have a very well insulated area with the place to put an air conditioner unit and a cool bot. Link below for CoolBot. They did provide that for us for free. So this video is not sponsored by them, but I did get the CoolBot for free. Just want you to know that affiliate link below, but awesome product, very, very helpful staff. I called them on a holiday, just expecting to leave a message and somebody called me back because I was having a problem and they called me back and helped me fix the problem. It is not plug and play. Because you are tripping an air conditioner unit, some things are a little funny and you might have a little bit of trouble. Um, but their staff is so helpful, they'll work you through it, make sure you get it right. Give yourself plenty of time. Don't order the cool bot a day before you get the animal butchered because you want to make sure it's right and it does take a little playing around with. But cool bot is a couple hundred dollars versus if you get a commercial freezer, you're talking thousands and thousands of dollars. So it doesn't work in every instance, but for a lot of homesteaders, CoolBot air conditioner unit, great solution. I learned about it for this project and it works great. And here we are now using it for some deer, some pheasant, got all kinds of good stuff. The, uh, we've ate sheep in here and pigs, it's been fantastic. Now let me tell you what we did wrong in here, which ruined an entire beef. And it hurts my heart to say, I'll show you it's right here. I don't know if you can see, yeah, I guess you can. This is a, one of the pillars in the room and we did spray foam insulation. That's what that stuff is. This is what went wrong. I'm gonna leave this room because it's cold in here and it's echoey. Let's talk about it outside. All right, so the moment you've all been waiting for, the end, how did we ruin an entire beef? Let's talk about that. As you saw in that uh, walk-in meat cooler, meat locker, uh, it was in the ground and it was buried by you know earth, so there was some insulation there. But we weren't able with the cool bot running in that big area, we weren't able to get it as cold as we wanted. I wanted it to be like 35, 36 degrees for aging a beef or a venison. So they suggested, CoolBot suggested further insulate the room. We could have done that in any number of ways. We decided because of the ease of installation to go with spray foam, a closed cell spray foam. And I don't know if I would do that again looking back. Uh, that wasn't exactly the mistake, I'll get into it, but closed cell spray foam has a serious off gas smell, off smell to it. Uh, it's supposed to cure within a day and they say it's safe to live in. You know, if you have it put in your house or whatever, it's safe within a day. I don't know if I'd put it in my house. I don't know if I believe that, but I figured for a meat locker, it was gonna be fine. So we sprayed it and we wound up uh, doing that a couple days before we did the butchering. And that was the mistake. Yeah, while it might have cured better in a house or, you know, regular hotter temperature outside. Down in that um, apple barn, the root cellar, it took a long time to cure. And the smell of the spray foam was still there. After we had killed the cow and hung and aged that cow, and I aged it for like almost a month in there. And so what it did was it absorbed the smell of that spray foam into the meat. And I don't know if you've ever smelled that spray foam smell, but it is a chemical smell. It is not a nice smell. And darn it if I didn't read just the same week we did this, 
an article about setting up a meat locker and they talked about inoculating the room with good smells. They said, be careful if you're aging something, the chamber you age it in, it can pick up the smell of what's around it. So inoculate it with a good mold, like take an aged piece of beef and rub it on the walls and get the room smelling good. Put some baking soda to absorb bad odors. I didn't even think about the spray foam. It was stupid, I know, uh, but I didn't even think about it as a possibility for a bad smell. I was thinking like, you know, there's no funky smell in the room. Uh, I didn't inoculate the room with, uh, you know, an old aged steak. Uh, wouldn't have mattered, wouldn't have covered up that spray foam. What I should have done was waited. Should have done the spray foam and waited a long time. I didn't, and that whole entire carcass absorbed that chemical smell, and it ruined it. Words can't describe just the kick in the gut that, that was the first time we had one of those steaks. First off, it was an animal we loved and didn't want to put down. We weren't planning on it, but we were trying to make the best of a situation. And so we decided, you know what, we'll, we'll butcher her. The meat is still safe. Our family can enjoy that. The smell of that chemical was in the meat. And what happened was we took a bite and the initial bite of that one month aged Jersey beef was incredible. So here's my bonus thing that I learned. Jersey beef is so delicious. Aged Jersey beef, best beef I've ever had. It was so good. The first bite was just like, oh man, this is incredible. And then all of a sudden you would smell it. The taste was good, but the smell of the chemical would hit you and you spit it out, couldn't eat it. The whole cow, whole cow ruined, a whole beef. Heart, heartbreaking, uh, lesson learned, make sure your room has no funky smell. If you do spray foam insulation, let it a long, long time to cure. We actually wound up painting the room with a sealant paint that like is made to hold back smell and is used in freezers and, and um, food storage. So we had to wind up painting the whole room like that. Eventually, the paint smell got left and sealed. And now here we are, about a, it took about a, probably a month to go by for all the smells to be gone and the room to be fine. And now we're using it and now it's working great. But we lost an entire cow. And that, especially the year we've had, the fact that it was this cow and this circumstance, it just it broke our heart. I'm gonna get a lot of negative comments, I know. Uh, try to be kind. You know, we everybody makes mistakes and I am sharing the mistake so that those of you out there watching, maybe some of you will avoid making the same mistake we did. If you wanna know about the equipment that I use for all my butchering and uh, standby love stuff that works good unlike that handsaw I bought which was garbage I'll have a link below to all that and any shopping you do through our Amazon link helps us by the way click here to get on our email list when that butcher equipment I see it go on sale on Amazon quite a lot I've seen the knives as much as half off and they're not cheap knives $40 $30 knives uh, I send emails out to everyone on the email list saying hey this stuff is on sale, don't miss out. So if you'd like to get good discounts on the butcher gear, whenever I see it go on sale, I let try to let everybody know. Get on our email list, hope you enjoyed this video. Stay tuned, the next video in this series we're gonna do is things I learned butchering my first pigs. And spoiler alert, I didn't waste any pig. The pork turned out great, we loved it. Uh, so I'll let you know about that in the upcoming video. 